The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss. Welcome to the first lecture of the final movement of Debussy's La Mer. This is such an exciting movement, and actually I'm just feeling a lot of momentum going into this last movement. It's a piece of music that has huge amounts of dynamic and coloristic variation. It's so filled with wonderful ideas, and you can feel the excitement of the composer as he was composing this work and orchestrating it. Before we dive in, let's take a quick look at the instrumentation. As I mentioned in the introductory video before I started this series of lectures, the instrumentation for each movement is pretty much identical, except for the final movement, which adds a couple of instruments that aren't used before. And that's mainly the two cornets. Uh, excuse me that the two is sort of cut off here and looks a little bit like a one, but yeah, this is two cornets. And one thing that is interesting to point out is that the cornets are tuned in C. Most of the time, cornets are tuned in B flat. So Debussy is scoring this as if they were to be played on C instruments, which might have been available to him at that point. But today, pretty much everybody uses B-flat cornets and then just plays the C parts on them in those rare works like this. The other thing to watch out for is we're adding this contrabassoon. Notice it's not the third bassoonist playing contrabassoon, but it is actually a fourth bassoonist coming in to play contra. But the contrabassoon is scored at pitch rather than transposing the octave, like double basses, which is the standard for contrabassoon scoring. For some reason, the publishers saw fit to publish the contrabassoon part without transposing. If you go and look at the parts that were published along with this score, they are scored in the standard transposition of an octave, just like any other contrabassoon part. So, I'm not sure, perhaps this was an engraving standard for that particular year by this particular publisher, but it's extremely rare to see contrabassoon parts scored like this. However, I don't really have the time to go through this entire score and to kind of mess around with it and make all the parts of a particular instrument look differently throughout the entire score. I mean, I feel like I'm doing enough work already just to reformat all of these pages to landscape format. Now the other thing I wanted to talk about with regard to this movement is its title. It is the Dialogue of Wind and the Ocean, or Wind and the Sea. Some translations are Dialogue Between Wind and Waves, or Dialogue Between the Wind and the Sea, or whatever. And really this is just Debussy giving us a bit of a clue, or a bit of a reference, to his conception of the movement. And you can actually just see some of the dialogue elements built right into the music. This very savage opening right here is definitely the ocean waking up and getting aggressive. Along with the steady background trembling kind of sound. Then of course the wind seems to respond here. I'll point out a few of these elements in this first lecture, but I don't want to belabor the point. I think that it's pretty obvious what Debussy means most of the time, and a dialogue, in this case, of these two forces of nature doesn't necessarily have to be trading off. One element talking and then shutting up while the other element says its piece, right? <laughs> there are often times when what might be interpreted as both elements work together, rather like a duo than a conversation. So. That's something to just watch out for for fun, I would say. 
and to perhaps give a bit of a programmatic reference. But once again, we don't want to get too programmatic because there definitely is an impressionist element to this. Not to say that, once again, that Debussy was an impressionist composer, but that impressionism was definitely an element that he used, the emotional and artistic impression to things that he either imagined or experienced in real life. So with that introduction, let's take a look at the scoring. Debussy starts off here with a continuous roll in the timpani on that C. Now, I would really caution people against engraving rolls like this. In other words, a new trill line and marking on every single beat. It would be better when you intend to have a continuous roll just to have one line following the marking TR for trill. So just one line going all the way through without continuously saying trill, because this gives the impression that you want a separately articulated note on every downbeat, right? You could also remove all doubt by having tied notes right here, just to have ties going across the notes that are intended to feel continuous without separate articulation. Right? That's one approach. But all the timpanists I've ever heard play this as one continuous roll. So, yeah, just try to be clear on that. Here, there's clarity in this double bass roll. And this is actually the preferred way of notating for timpani as well, with most engravers and most composers today. And that is just to have the triple beam above, implying the same exact stroke as the double bass here. And here, there's absolutely no question that this is a continuous roll and there are no separately articulated notes. But some people go even further than that and will connect everything that is intended to be one continuous roll with a tie. And then when an articulation is implied, will break the tie. So those are all very fine points. But I would say if you really want a separate articulation, even if it's a soft note, you could put like a little accent on it. Right, and that would make it very, very clear that it's the beginning of a new role and that it has its own identity. Tam-tam, these little strokes right in here, return sort of mid-bar. Here they're coming in on the second beat. And that is sort of in reaction to the lower strings. And just right after them, sort of in the space that they leave behind, from their reverb in the concert hall, you have this on the tam-tam. Now, one thing that's kind of cool about the Kaleidoscope Orchestra's performance of this is that the percussionist is using a fairly small tam-tam. I'm kind of measuring, sort of looking at my hands and thinking it looks like about maybe two and a half, three feet wide kind of a tam-tam, rather than the really big four foot, five foot, six foot tam tams that you sometimes see and that smaller tam tam was probably the instrument that Debussy would have intended for his own works I'm not going to bet the farm on that but I'm pretty sure that Debussy would have been used to a smaller tam tam so it might be a lot more authentic the sound which is a little shallower a little less of a sustained kind of a sound the reverberations have less surface area to go over so they don't last as long. You know what I mean. Something else that I thought was kind of interesting about Kaleidoscope's performance of this, which we'll hear in 10 or 12 minutes, is that you can really feel the fourth beat right here. So in a lot of recordings and performances, you'll sort of hear and it's really hard to hear where that beat is. But with this, you can really hear da 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 And that may be just a little bit of emphasis that helps the rest of the orchestra kind of hear where all the beats are. And to keep everybody coordinated, even though there's no conductor. I would say even with a conductor, sometimes it's hard to sort of feel where that fourth beat is in terms of the stroke. Because... If the conductor is conducting in 2-2, right, uh, then there's a stroke here 
on the baton and then there's a stroke here. So in the middle of that stroke between stroke two and stroke one of the next bar, the best that the player can hope for is maybe an elbow from the conductor on that fourth quarter note. I really shouldn't have said fourth beat before. It really is the middle of the second beat. Now notice that in the last lecture, near the end, there were crescendos with downbow markings over them, which, as you probably noticed, are upside down downbow markings compared to the standard today, which is a staple with the prongs downwards, right? With Debussy style, it was a staple with the prongs upward, which actually looks like the frog of a bow, just as you're about to bow downwards. And that really is very clear. And then of course the V right here is kind of like the point of the bow, right? So that gives us more of a visual cue. I mentioned in that last lecture that the reason why Debussy had marked a down bow there was that the players might be tempted to go up bow at the beginning of that bar in order to make use of the bow's natural tendency to crescendo. Now here, Debussy is going with it. And he's saying, yes, definitely do up bow into that phrase. And actually here, it works perfectly fine because it's not on the downbeat, so it's pushing in and then down bow on the downbeat with the energy of the bow hitting hard and then receding quickly, which is also very helpful in a bowing scheme. Now here, that's all pulled back so that there can be an overall crescendo that leads to this part right in here. But isn't it amazing how savage the low strings can sound all on their own, no help from anybody, no doubling by contrabassoon, no doubling by trombones or tuba. They have this huge elemental force, speaking of elemental forces. They can just really shove at those pitches. Then here, Debussy's adding yet another octave with the violas coming in above. Isn't this interesting how the bass drum does not get a crescendo going into rehearsal mark 43? It's really just the timpani and the lower strings. Debussy just wants the rustle in the background of that bass drum. He doesn't want the bass drum to guide the music dynamically. He just wants it as this background color. Now, as to what goes on here at 43, I atomically analyzed what is happening here in my previous lecture on texture balance and function that I presented at a meeting of the Composers Association of New Zealand. And I actually just picked this particular phrase arbitrarily. I was going to write the script for the lecture or the notes for the lecture and I was just thinking what would be a good way of demonstrating my principles of texture balance and function in terms of analyzing a page or a bar or a section of orchestration and this just came up I was thinking about it and so I sort of leaped on it and it worked out great so I'm not going to go into huge detail I will just link it in the information below and you can jump to that if you want to really break it down. But what's going on here is actually kind of fun. We've got Divisi double basses, tremolo, sul ponticello, which gives them a sort of a glassy sound. And then an octave higher than that, we've got the timpani surging in and out, right? Sort of using this as a bass line, which doesn't surge, and then just moving in and out dynamically. Now what's interesting here is that the timpanist is actually playing kind of half as fast as the previous roll. What I mean by that is that let's say that you could play 64 times on one drum head over the space of one of these bars. Okay, So 64 strokes making this roll. I don't know what the actual number would be, but that's just an arbitrary number we can use to calculate. So that means that this C is rolling at a very, very steady, nice groove 
and it has an indistinguishable sound that still has that quality of roughness that happens in any roll. Now here, you cannot have 64 strokes on each of these drum heads because one timpani player is playing both of these pitches, one under either mallet, right? So that means you will only hear 32 of these F sharps and 32 of these C's. So the frequency of strokes for each pitch is half. And the result of that is with that slower frequency, a crescendo like this actually comes off as more wild and less perfectly conceived, right? Because you have this kind of idea rather than just brrrr. If you see what I mean, it's less smoothly contoured and kind of more back and forth. And I have actually heard many timpanists really kind of go wild here. And you really hear the rattling between the two kettles as opposed to a nice smoothly rolled note. And I think that's completely intentional by Debussy. Underpinning that low F sharp, we've got the written at pitch, remember, note of F sharp. And then above that, we have the winds, right? It's kind of funny, the conversation of winds and the ocean, right? So. You could almost think of, oh, hey, you know, the winds are the wind, representing the elemental force of the wind in this piece. And here they really kind of do. So you've got your oboes on top, and then under them, under this E major third, we've got an A minor third, right? This B sounding A, this D sounding C. One of the really interesting things about this is that everybody is scored in sharps here. The beginning key of this movement is E major, but the clarinets, which could easily have been scored in A, are actually scored as B-flat clarinets. And I don't know what the reason for that was. I can only guess. Maybe Debussy wanted the slightly more trebly sound of the B-flat clarinet right in here. What I would think about that is it's a suggestion to the clarinet player to play in a less rich, kind of more tinny kind of a sound. Because as I mentioned in other lectures and in my course on winds, there really isn't a huge difference in timbral quality. I mean, yes, there is if you're really, really, really listening for specific kinds of features. But clarinet players, if they see what's up, in your intentions by asking for a particular instrument where the other one would do actually better in terms of reading and so on, then they will actually just make the clarinet sound richer or more trebly, depending on what they feel the music needs. They have the ability to do that just with their embouchure. So I would say this is probably unnecessary scoring six flats just to use the B-flat clarinets because of some perception of a lighter sound or a more trebly sound. Certainly for these pitches only played a half step apart in terms of fingering on the different instruments of the A and the B-flat, but of course sounding the same if you were to transpose from one to the other. Anyhow, any clarinetists out there are welcome to jump in with your perspectives about that, but I don't feel it's all that necessary for your scoring, but for WC scoring, it's fine. I love this little push right back in here. You've got the F trumpets underlining the same pitch as the clarinets, just giving them some spice with their muted sound, right? And so that fades off much, much quicker than the diminuendo of the B flat clarinets but then the clarinets push back in and you can hear that coming in before there's this spike at the middle of the bar again. Everything calms down. We get another push from our lower strings. Notice that he's telling the bassist to go back to just a normal position for the bow rather than being sol ponticello. And here we have this wonderfully Russian sound of contrabassoon, 
first and second bassoon in octaves with the English horn playing the same middle C transposed of the first bassoon. It really has this wonderfully pungent sound. Here's where I would agree that double reeds can sound nasal. That's kind of a cliche, really, in orchestration manuals to call double reed instruments nasal. I feel that they're only as nasal as you score them to be. And right in here, we have that very intentionally nasally sound, especially the way that it pushes into the crescendo and kind of cuts off or falls off on the downbeat of the next bar. Same thing going on. English horn, two bassoons, and contrabassoon on the bottom, which once again, this is contrabassoon at pitch. So it's actually just an octave down rather than two octaves down, as you might expect from just normal score reading. And of course, these are separated by another push by the double basses. Then this lovely punctuation of a pizzicato, pluck. And the same idea returns, only scored up a minor third. We've got oboes on top, just like before, clarinets below, just like before. But instead of muted trumpets, we've got horns. And these horns, instead of doubling the clarinets in any way, are actually just playing the same chord an octave lower. So with their mutes, they have a similar quality to the muted trumpets like before, but of course their unique timbre. And I also love the dynamic difference here of just really pushing all the way into this apex rather than backing off and coming back like they did before. Everything else is pretty much the same. The timpani rolling and the bass drum continuing on with its background rattle and the tam-tam going boosh on the half measure. But there is no double bass right in here, kind of backing up the timpani from an octave below. Here we have some more pungent playing. <laughs> and notice that there's like no flute going on on either of these screens. It's really great that some textures, some colors are withheld. And Debussy can just really focus in on one kind of sound picture, even with all its different variations. So we've got this simple octave here, octave Ds with a C stuck in the middle, and then that C is, in its relationship, the same diminished fifth to the F sharp below, but of course, an extra octave apart. So he's developing his harmonic ideas, and they progress through this. Then we get our first taste of a motive that is going to be important for the rest of the movement. These introductory ideas aren't necessarily as pivotal as just these two notes. Da -da! <laughs> and just that anticipatory rising is something that was used in a similar way in the past two movements, but not as focused, right? This is just really letting us know that da -da! is going to be a really, really important idea. It's going to come back and it's going to actually guide things and it's going to happen at the beginning of other themes and so on. So this little motive is incredibly fundamental to how this piece goes. Then we have a similar reaction right here with the oboes slurring up C sharp to D sharp in more of a grace note than in this specifically scored fashion. But the oboists tend to imitate what's going on with the other wind players here in most interpretations that I've heard. This repeats again, and I really love the way that the oboes come in here and double what's going on in the bassoons an octave higher. Once again, we get the intentionally nasal sound of the double reeds accentuated with this kind of scoring. How could it not, right, when you have the oboes marked up a dynamic degree from the rest of the winds and playing in their most pungent register? It's as if Debussy realizes that he can't really score lower than the dynamic P anyways, to be honest about it, at these low pitches, C going down to B, accompanying all of this pushing here. 
we've got the same basic harmony being outlined by staccato divisi lower strings. Yeah, da -da 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 -da. And that is such great suspenseful scoring. Now this is all leading forward to another highly punctuated bar, but let's stop there so that you can really focus on all of the things that we talked about there. The wonderfully rough reedy sound of some of this low double reed scoring right here and over here the very pungent sound of the oboes right in here this lovely reaction here the introduction of that motive da -da! and then the response of the oboes coming right after the differences between this second statement here with the horns playing the same chord as the upper winds with the first statement that is much sparer, isn't it? Just two oboes, two clarinets, and a touch of trumpet supporting the clarinet. And then of course this amazingly effective sort of shoving little motive happening down here, which by the way does not actually dominate the rest of this movement. These four screens that we're looking at today are more of a prelude in a lot of ways than an introduction. It's almost as if the attention of the audience is directed towards a somewhat chaotic landscape where things don't really gel in terms of melodies, rhythms, and harmony in the way that 19th century, early 20th century listeners would be accustomed. Rather, it is almost like little scraps of ideas that start to come together later on, but at the beginning are not necessarily random, but they are intentionally disrupted in their organization from having that kind of continuity and that relation to each other that is so predictable and so easy to grab the ear with. And that took a lot of courage, I think, for Debussy, but also a lot of inspiration. Once again, I feel Debussy on a roll here, just really knowing what he wanted and knowing that it would shock and then entrance the listener. So have a listen to all of that, and I will see you on the third screen. In the second half of the lecture, we can see that new themes are emerging. Or are they? Actually, this theme is taken from the first movement. If you recall, right at the beginning of the first movement, there was this wonderful theme that was introduced by muted trumpet and English horn in octaves. Here it's returning with some changes to it. It's not quite as mysterious and filled with longing as before. Here it's more in your face, <laughs> starting with a single solo muted trumpet and then repeating doubled with first and second muted trumpet. There isn't really any tonal relationship between the way the theme is being used here and the way that it was used in the first movement. There isn't really that much of a relationship. However, there is one thing that is markedly different, and that is pushing this theme a little bit higher and getting a much, much brighter sound and more of kind of a clarion call of alarm or tension or just sheer excitement. The first statement starts in the middle of a bar, making the first long note held two extra beats. And then when it returns, it's more like the standard theme that we're going to hear returning in different places in this movement, with just two beats plus this quarter note triplet beat. But let's look at how it's framed. 
that's actually the most interesting part on this page. It's all the orchestration around it. Starting here with this um, boom boom sounding F sharp and then an octave higher coming in with the first and the third. Notice the low horns and then the high horns. Very, very well done. This has got a marcato staccato, and you know, what does that mean, really? Like, a marcato is a really big push. Here, WC is actually asking staccato, but then having a note that is four beats long. So, it's kind of another way of saying, like, fortissimo forte, right? Or fortissimo mezzo forte. So, he wants a big push on that note, but then he wants it to stay loud, right? So it's really just a big spike on that first note that's intended. A very abrupt and exaggerated accent. That's being punctuated by really forceful pizzicato on the same sounding F sharp by our middle strings here, violas and cellos. And then of course here we've got divisi in three, sol tosto, first and second violins in octaves. And that, plus the rolled cymbal in the background, is the background for this. I sort of failed to mention that the lower horns were also being punctuated by this hit on the bass drum. Apologies. Now that is leading to, speaking of bass drum, this beautifully cinematic gesture right in here. And we have some of the same elements that we saw on the first screen returning. Low F sharp, and then here we're actually getting the C to form the diminished fifth. And then an octave above that, we have that same roll of a diminished fifth between timpani. And then, of course, the big push in the middle of it means that the sound is going to be a bit wild, along with the tam-tam stroke in the middle. But what makes it darker and richer in this case, more wild, is that it isn't horns that are filling in the space. It is trombones and tuba which have an extremely foreboding character right in here. It's a beautiful use of trombones. And here we've got the bassoons playing against it. And they actually have a shot <laughs> of being heard here because we've got tripled bassoons going D sharp to grace note up to E. And against this texture, there is some shot of hearing these A3 ah bassoons against these single pitches by the trombone. Now, the second statement of the melody has got this intriguing accompaniment. Mezzo forte, octaves and thirds, pushing and then dropping off to piano. And then this big push once more. And along with these pushes, we've got these little spikes in here. Now, once again, these are these same low F sharps. And they are kind of going wah, wah right here, right? Along with the little scoop of the grace notes. And as this climbs, we have this lovely little arc here, this chromatic arc going up a couple of half steps and then coming back down. And that is doubled by winds. These clarinets are doubling what's going on in the violas. Remember, we are dealing with B-flat clarinets, not A clarinets yet. And then this cor anglais pitch right here, this sounding A is doubling the lower voice of the firsts. And then right at the top, the oboes come in and just catch the very last couple of pitches. And this is some very clever, very sparse doubling by the winds that keeps things from doubling note for note across the entire spectrum and just emphasizes certain aspects of the harmony in the strings without overdoing it. And I think that that is also beautifully coloristic. There's this very cool push here on the second beat of each bar, pizzicato in the cellos. And then there's this rising harmony here in tremolo as the trumpets finish up the second statement of that theme and some rising pitches in the horns as well. Notice here... <laughs> WC has said, okay, change to A clarinets. And I have to say, once again, this is just really the most unnecessary thing. There isn't really anything about the distinct quality of the A clarinet versus the B flat clarinet, unless you are emphasizing that quality 
very knowingly in a way where the clarinets are really brought out as a specific feature in a very subtle way. But this isn't that kind of scoring. There isn't really anything about the clarinet scoring for the first three screens of this movement that begs for a B-flat clarinet versus an A clarinet. So I don't know what clarinetists do right in here. Perhaps they just hold on to their A clarinets and transpose, or maybe they do make the switch just because it's written that way. But I don't think it really makes any difference, especially with all of this low scoring, right? Where you would really hear the difference would be maybe in the lower Clarino register. But, I mean, it's really not that big of an issue. Here the music gets tremendously exciting. <laughs> Thematically, we just have that da-da. <laughs> and actually, it is responding to the chord, right? So you have this chord, and then you got da-da by the horns and then adding the trumpet an octave higher than that, remembering that horns and trumpets are basically playing an octave apart even though they are scored on the same pitches. Remember our F transposition model in which the trumpets sound a perfect fourth higher and the horns sound a perfect fifth lower, right? So that's what's going on here. So in terms of actual thematic material, what's going on here is extremely simple. But all the same, it's very effective and very exciting. I would say the most effective aspect to this screen is the way that all of these overtones line up wildly on these alternating bars. First these two and then these four. So what is going on there? Let's study that before we get into the other parts, because I don't feel that they are as important as what's going on here. So we're back to A clarinet, right? So transposing down a minor third. So down a minor third from G is E and so on. So this is the same E third that we're seeing in the bassoons. And it's the same E third that is being played by oboes and then by flutes above. And then here the cor anglais is basically just doubling the G sharp of the first clarinet. So stacking all of these thirds on top of each other is actually a kind of risky thing. It's something that could end up sounding very organ like. But in this configuration, all of the wind section members basically taking their score positions, <laughs> low to high, what's created is really just this mass of reinforcing overtones. So the flutes on top just sound very, very piercing, where they normally wouldn't in any other kind of harmony. Stacked like this, especially above oboes and then clarinets, they are catching that overtone right here. And then of course, the bassoons are pushing at the clarinets and especially at the oboes, two octaves higher. So there's this really rich bath of overtones, not to mention the overtones that the flutes themselves are creating. So it's almost like a ship's whistle or some other kind of thing. But here, obviously, the color is just really the whistling wind and the sense of apprehension facing the surging seas beneath that programmatic element really starts to come through the Impressionism, doesn't it? And before then, we have similar stacks, right? We have F-sharp seconds. This is enharmonically an F-sharp second. This is catching that same top pitch of the clarinets, and then F-sharp seconds two octaves above the bassoons. Same thing again right in here. So it's pretty basic scoring. I mean, it's really not complex at all. It's very simple, almost brutal scoring, but the effectiveness of it is amazing. <laughs> it is beautifully crafted. Then we've got timpani, ba-bum, and then roll to an accent, roll to an accent, and so on. And little touches symbol, bass drum and cymbal going back and forth. And right in here, we are going from soltasto to 
Sul Ponticello. And basically, this is really just the same thing in octaves going across the entire string section, right? Starting on G sharp here and then just adding an octave. So it's such economical scoring. It doesn't require the string players to change their hand position at all, right? So they're basically just staying right in here over the same notes over and over and over again, and then just adding an octave higher with the second violin. If you ever have the choice to do something like this, always use this option rather than having the players jump up an octave going back and forth on the same strings, right? So if you've got seconds that aren't doing anything and you need to jump up an octave, then just have the seconds come in and play that octave. And then right in here, as things get a little bit more intense in terms of the dynamics, not in terms of the pitches, they're always the same all the way through. WC is just adding the last four pitches with the firsts and it just gets really, really intense here. Mezzo forte pushing to, I would say, molto forte, not just forte. And then here we have this big crash, which would be cymbal, timpani, bass drum, and then the same three pitches, C, D, E, all right? C, D, E, C, D, E, C, D, E. Notice the beaming here. <clears throat> Don't do this kind of beaming all the time. Here, Debussy is doing it because these are individually articulated notes. And so he can't really phrase them with slurs, right? So he's really giving the players the clearest, most emphatic instruction that these should just really be echoing motives. However, with this kind of scoring, it's so easy to confuse it with triplets and everything else. And here that is not an issue because it's so simply scored. But the problem is that you'll see a technique like this in a score like WC, and then you'll build on it. And then in the process of building on it, you may end up with very confusing layouts of rhythms. So in this case, where it's extremely basic I would say that using beams to express groups of notes, almost like little motives or phrases, is perfectly fine. But just don't overdo it. This is actually my favorite part of the whole screen. Ending up on this massive open G string for the violins, and I would say probably violas will join in with that. And so will the cellos, just to get the most forceful, loudest note. This G natural, however, will have to be fingered by the basses because the actual open G string is an octave higher. Then here, up a half step. It's still incredibly effective because even though that isn't an open string, it is one of the lowest notes on the violins possible and a very low note on both cello and viola, not to mention the double basses. And this is really nice right in here, this G sharp. Notice that there's a bit of shifting back and forth between G sharp, G natural, and everything else. And probably most timpanists will interpret this as rolling a G sharp, and then in this case, just leaving it tuned to G sharp. And in fact, I would say probably all of these are intended to be G sharps, because if you look at the other elements in this piece, these low G sharps here, starting off each of these phrases, then of course the G sharps in these E thirds, then it really just kind of lines up. So yeah, it's a little weird, but it's probably what was intended there. And with that <laughs> rather nebulous observation, I will leave you to listen to the music and to think about all of those things that we just discussed, the way especially that all of these pitches stack up and reinforce each other in kind of an ear cutting way really that just is slightly uncomfortable to the ear the way everything sits on top of everything else and just makes it more penetrating to the ear and then of course just this little bit of thematic information da -da, repeating and then adding the trumpet an octave on top of that and then these sort of quickly shuffling upward sweeping motives right in here. Think about just how easy it is to add another player or group of players 
rather than just making everybody jump up an octave in situations like this. Listen to this really effective ending right in here. The way that these three blind mice walk up and then jump down, walk up, jump down, walk up again, and so on in their little three note beamed groups. And then of course this ending note, forceful, marcato, in other words, hammering this note down, responded to with a very short sec, right? So same thing, marcato accent, staccato, and dry. <laughs> and then back to the strings, which play a very forceful pizzicato up a half step. Listen for all that on this first screen, and then remember all the stuff that we talked about at the beginning of this part of the lecture. The way we've got punctuation on these the lower horns on the bass drum. And then the pizzicato along with the upper horns. And these stacked tremolo harmonies in the violins with a little bit of cymbal roll underneath it. Cushioning the reintroduction of this theme from the first movement. And then this wonderful piece of cinematic scoring right in here which I'm sure was imitated by many different orchestrators and composers in Hollywood in the 30s and 40s. Listen for that touch of tam-tam right in there, and for whether or not you feel that the tripled bassoons really made a difference right in there against the trombones and their ferocity. And then, of course, listen for these low concert F-sharps in the horns just sort of surging a little bit underneath the A2 trumpet melody, and how that same melody is crowned by this up and down parallel motion in tremolo strings, doubled very judiciously on certain pitches by the winds. So listen for all of those things, and I will see you in a few days. I'm going to try to release most of these lectures at the beginning of this month because I've got a massive project I need to work on over September and October which I want to avoid interrupting by these lectures, which can actually become very compulsive and pull my attention away from other things that need doing. So enjoy this, get set for a couple more lectures here at the beginning of this month, and I'll see you soon.